brief bit about it on the introduction round, as was said, that my background, as I said, was about the fact that I enjoy PowerShell. I think it's an amazing tool for helping make our life easier, mainly because it gives us a consistent way of working with all of our systems and not just from Microsoft, which I'll allude to a bit later on. In terms of the topics that I would like to, to cover off on, first off is to, to put down the context about what uh, Snova was considering as he started working on the development of this back in the, the early 2000s and the role that he sees it as having in the system, sort of the whole environment. Then going into who should be interested in this, and the short answer to that for me is everyone, but I'll be a bit more specific about it. But having said that PowerShell is important, we all operate on a sort of what's in it for me type thing. So I want to look at what is it actually for? What are we trying to achieve by using PowerShell and what are we gonna get from it? Brief look at how you make sure that you've got PowerShell up and running and any issues around that. And I want to then start to experiment more and look more deeply into what you can actually do with it. And then I had hoped to run quite a few demonstrations, a few going through it, as well as quite a few at the end. And we'll have another go at seeing if we can get in control and I can uh, start to show you on my machine just what's happening when we get to that part of it. But getting into it, Snova, who came up with this uh, as a concept, had a very specific vision. He actually published a thing called the Monad Manifesto. It was originally called Monad. And this was his view, and as he's saying here, part of what he was seeing is that we had a lot of tools for managing our, particularly Windows environments. There were a lot of GUI tools that were being produced by the different technology teams. Uh, one of the issues with that though was that for each of the GUIs, as the products became larger, so did the GUIs, which meant that if you wanted to do something, I suppose, reasonably quick, you frequently had to delve through a lot of areas and lost a lot of uh, subscreens to find the particular element that you wanted to work with or that you wanted to configure. And also as you went from technology to technology, the screen designs, the layouts were, were quite different. We got MMC snap-ins for managing chunks of it, uh, a lot of the same sort of issues cropping up with there. We also got the support from different languages and in many cases, what we ended up with were things called resource kits. So if you're working with say Active Directory, you could get a copy of the Active Directory resource kit, and that would provide you with a lot of command line tools, which meant that you could then automate by using batch files. But one of the big issues with this was that if you started with one technology, you became very familiar with the, the resource kit to support that. If you now took up responsibility for another technology, uh, you got a different resource kit that worked the way that that development team thought was a good idea, and essentially the learning you did on the first resource kit was of very little use as you tried to learn how the second one worked. And so what Snova was believing, you either had the top end sort of GUI, uh, like a huge glorified wizard for managing your system, or very low level access either through the programming models or to send through these resource kits. He believed what we needed was something in the middle to actually manage that so we could control it more effectively. His vision for what the solution would be would be a model for all of this automation, automation a shell which would actually handle this. And this was saying, okay, rather than using cmd.exe, that would simply go, hopefully. This would be the new shell, the new way that we would work. He would have management models which supported that. The ability to work across our entire system so that the concept of remoting would be built into it. And the ability to build control on top of that as well. And I believe that he has delivered on this. Now, one thing I have found over the decades that I've been involved with this technology is it is often difficult to get excited about what's being perceived as the next big thing, this new amazing thing that's visionary, that's remarkable. Because I find frequently, when I look conceptually at what's involved, I've probably seen it before. Uh, the old saying is, there's not much that's new under the sun. When I looked at SharePoint when it came out, well, a lot of what was involved there conceptually was basically what we had in Lotus Notes. When I looked at the iPhone, well, while the engineering is beautiful, conceptually, uh, very similar to the Palm Trio from the 90s. And so, yeah, a lot of it as I went through, you see, it's nice, it's new, it's better, but you'd expect it to be better. But then when PowerShell came along, I thought, no, this is really an exciting change. This is a, a really fantastic difference that has occurred. Now, under the hood, you could say, well, actually, we have seen it all before. We have had command shells for a long time. The Unix people would say, we've had command shells forever and a hell of a lot more powerful than what people work with in DOS. What Snova did, though, was come up with this idea of making it the one shell which could be extended and could be altered and be personalized. And we've done this in a lot of ways with some phenomenal results on this. 
And part of the deal, which I think is very important as this has come through too, is that all of the technology teams agree to buy into how this works. So there is a way that PowerShell works. And this is where I think one of the two elements of great beauty in this particular product come in. If people buy into the model of how PowerShell works, that means when you learn how to use it in one context, you've actually learned how to use it in all contexts. Now, that has had some interesting, I suppose, results in terms of how the language and the commands work. One of them in particular being is that when things were named in PowerShell, they've been named to be generic. Because not only do they have to match and work and make sense across all of the things we work with today, they also have to make just as much sense with the new technologies that are going to come in over the next two to five years, for 10 years' time. The other part of it is that it is an object-oriented environment. It's actually built on top of .NET, which is a significant part of its design. But it means that when we work with things in PowerShell, we're actually working with objects with, rather than screens. When we work with cmd.exe, one of the big problems with that was that everything we had was a textual representation. It was designed to put stuff on the screen for somebody to read. While we had the idea of the pipeline way back then, and it's been basically around forever, is that it was a very little use because what we had to do to make the pipeline work was take output design for the screen, somehow change it, because if we're piping it, we had to convert it to suitable input to match what keystrokes would have been put in if someone happened to use the utility, which effectively made the pipeline useless. The object structure that we have behind this, behind PowerShell, makes it incredibly useful. And that actually makes the pipeline work. So to me, that's one of the really big parts of it. As we go through, we'll start to look at some of the other elements which crop up through this as well. Looking at the idea of the PowerShell part of it, it is part of Microsoft's common engineering criteria, so it's designed to work across their entire system. It is a replacement for the old DOS box, and it's supported not just by Microsoft, but a lot of other vendors as well. VMware, if you're running VMware environments and use PowerCLR as your command line tool, fundamentally what that is, is PowerShell with an extra 400 commands specifically written to support the VMware environment. Citric have support for it. Cisco, huge uh, support for their data center environment. Thousands of, of options there. And a lot of hardware vendors have also provided support through PowerShell. So the, the reason for the little coffee cup in the bottom right hand corner of that slide is I believe that this is truly a wake up and smell the coffee time, and it actually has been for a while. With the buy-in we've had from all across the board, it basically means if you want to do any command line support of any of your environments, PowerShell is going to be the consistent way of doing it. It's also being ported out into Linux type environments as well. So its reach is going even further. And so I believe it is crucial that we become familiar with PowerShell, not just because of what it offers us, but because of what's there. Unfortunately, quite a few of these slides were designed for me to run, which we build, which is why these get a little bit less readable. Uh, it is designed as a command line interface, and if you want to, you can use it purely as a command line. You have functional blocks, which are called commandlets, although a lot of the, the documentation I'm now reading, they just simply call them commands. I think it's sort of finding it just easier to do. You get uh, a lot of them supplied as part of the systems. You can make your own up. Uh, for example, I've got one a variation on the convert to HTML because it didn't work quite the way that I wanted to do it. And it also, though, is a scripting language. It's a C style language, whereas Visual Basic was obviously with the BB scripting was a basic style language. So the language structure is a little bit more arcane because of the C style nature of it, but it also gives you some very powerful programming constructs. And that's also getting richer as we work our way through it as well. In PowerShell 2, because we're currently up to PowerShell 5, PowerShell 2 provided us with a programming editor. If you worked in PowerShell 1 and thinking back to the labs that Microsoft gave us from PowerShell 1, we would use Notepad. Now, I personally believe that if anyone is doing any scripting work using Notepad, they deserve all of the pain that they must be feeling. At the very least, use a, an editor which understands a little bit about the structured text. But in PowerShell 2, we got PowerShell ISE. It was very limited in what it did. Fundamentally, it gave us an editor that said, oh, I understand I'm working with PowerShell, and I'll do some color coding for you. But that was about it. PowerShell 3, they enhanced it considerably and actually put IntelliSense in there. So it works as a true programming editor. 
Uh, I use that, I also use a, a commercial product quite a bit as well. But I've found that PowerShell ISC is, is very useful. It, it works very well with the standard scripting. And it is also extendable in its own right. Um, you can basically hack it with your own code. Um, rather intriguing feature of it is that within the PowerShell scripting environment, it exposes itself so you can reprogram it. Uh, and so if PowerShell ISC doesn't quite work the way you want it to work, you can get stuck in and change it dramatically to make it work exactly the way that you want it to work for you. And there are a lot of people out there who have written add-ins to actually enhance how it works as well. This to me is, is trying to set the scale. When PowerShell first came out, it was relatively small, certainly by today's standards. When we got it baked in in Server 2008, there were only 587 commands for managing your server. By the time we got to Server 2012, it was just under 2,400 commands. So going from 2008 to R2 to 2012, almost five times growth. And this is just in the commands available for managing essentially a member server if you do nothing else to it. As soon as you start to add other functionality in, you gain more. In Server 2016, while I haven't managed to track down the exact number of commands which are available, I did find that looking at what we knew, they've added 500. So whatever two, uh, 2012 R2 had in it, we now have, an have another 500 commands available to us. And then each time you add some technology in, you will get a lot more. So in SharePoint, you've got uh, around 700 commands for SharePoint. Cisco, thousands of commands, as I said earlier. Power CLI from VMware, another 400 commands. Add SQL Server into the mix, you get more commands again. So the numbers of commands available to you, what I consider essentially to be the size of the toolkit, is growing dramatically. The languages, the scripting environment is also changing. Version two, the big thing we got from that was the ability to create script-based modules rather than having to get a .NET developer to write and produce DLLs for us to include within our environment as Snappins. We can now write our own enhancements in the PowerShell scripting language and deploy them as script files within a module structure, which makes deployability of extra functionality and in particular deployability with an organization a lot more straightforward. PowerShell 3 made some slight changes to the language, uh, nothing particularly significant, I say, but also gave us PowerShell ISC that worked properly with IntelliSense. One of the ramifications of the change they're going to 3 though was that if you developed scripts in 3, there were things in the language changes that meant they wouldn't run on PowerShell 2. So that did become an issue at the time when that change first happened. The big change in PowerShell 4 was to get desired state configuration. This gives us the ability to manage our system, our configuration in code. We write a scripting file using a special keyword, which was part of the language enhancement which meant that we could describe how we wanted a machine to be, describing in terms of what functionality, what resources must be available on it, and equally what ones must not be there as well. And this was designed in many ways for managing uh, configuration drift. In a lot of cases, you, you build a server, you deploy the server, it's up and running, you go back and check it in six months, and you find that somebody else has been doing some maintenance and they added some functionality on for the little bit of work they're doing and then forgot to remove it. The catch with that now is that it's now not quite the way that it should be. Or part of that maintenance may have been to find an issue with a particular part of what was installed. So that was actually removed or at least disabled while it was being sorted out. And for some reason, never got turned back on again. Uh, the idea of the desired state configuration is you have this file uh, which is used to produce a MOF, so it's part of the, the management structure. That MOF can be deployed and then the configuration managers can make sure that the machines are actually adhering to the design that was meant to be there. If people put things on which were meant to not be there, they will be removed. If people take things off that are meant to be there, it will make sure that they go back on. So it's a very, very neat way of actually managing the deployment of functionality and controlling what it's going to look like. So it's specifically for dealing with configuration drift. Version 5 of PowerShell, which came out with Windows 10 and Server 2016, the big change I see in many ways to that one was we can now actually create our own classes and, and enumerations. This is making PowerShell scripting language get closer 
to the sort of programming language that developers work with. And the concept of, work, of sort of DevOps, this is feeding into this very well. PowerShell, the scripting language, is becoming a real contender to be considered in many ways another .NET development language. As I said earlier, PowerShell requires .NET, it sits on top of the .NET framework. So all of the resources available to .NET developers are actually available to the PowerShell scripters as well. And that, I think, is a huge bonus for what we're doing as well. While a lot of the commands we use are good functional wrappers around that, the .NET framework, it makes it much easier for us to use and also is designed in a way which is, designed, which is shaped for administrators primarily. So, it, so instead of making it look like the things that developers spend their life in, the PowerShell commands make it suitable and comfortable for us doing administration. But if you need to go that step further, the thing is you can, you're not limited by that. So to me, that is a very, very big element of what we've got with PowerShell as well, which is a huge part of what the extendability that's on offer is. Having sort of, I suppose, set it up with the idea that we want it to be able to be all things to all people, you start to run the risk of getting something which is very generalized. And I think that's what we see with a lot of the GUI management tools that we have. You run up whatever the GUI is, and it has to be able to provide all of the things that anybody anywhere in the world might need. And as such, it tends to be very big and very general. The reality, though, is that you basically only really care about yourself. Well, you should. You want to make it work for you. And this is an area where I think PowerShell really does shine, is it can be personalized, and it can be done through a whole range of ways. Uh, by using special files, now, special in the sense of what they are called and where they reside on the file system, that's the only bit about it that's special. And we can set up profiles so that they're specifically for you logged in on this machine rather than someone else. Uh, or you can go the other way and say, no, this is anyone logging in on this machine will get it to look like this. You can also set it up by shells. Well, I said that Snova came up with a command line interface and it is called PowerShell. We have quite a variety of flavors. From Microsoft, we get two, PowerShell.exe, what looks like a more traditional command line interface, is a shell. When we run PowerShell ISE up, it's actually running a different shell. Equally, when you run PowerCLI, that will launch a different type of shell again. While there's a consistency underneath it in the, in the sense that it's all PowerShell, because these shells have a different identity, they can each have their own profile as well. That's why certainly with mine, I have a profile for PowerShell ISE. So when I use that, that profile will run up as well as the standard profile I have, and that will configure my PowerShell ISE environment to be the way I want it. When you run up the SQL PS, the SQL Server PowerShell, that's been set up to provide the functionality needed to make SQL Server support work. So we can make it absolutely down to how you want to work as well as being slightly more, I suppose, widely applicable to all users on a machine, particularly useful for servers. But another area too where you can even override it, because when the, the guys at Redmond were developing this, of course, they've got to develop their commands so that they will work in a way that makes reasonable sense to anybody anywhere in the world, which means that in many cases you get the most general the most sort of the lowest common denominator type values for defaults, if any defaults are ever given. I think a, a good example of this is that many commands have a parameter of computer name. So you say, I want to execute this command, but I want to execute it against a specific computer. The default value for that is local host. Uh, it makes perfect sense that when you're developing this to be deployed out across the globe, that you'd use something like local host, because after all, at least you know that will work. In reality, though, is that when you get to your environment, it is rare that you actually want to do it to your own computer, to your own workstation. You may well have a specific server that you frequently want to access and do this work with. We have a, an ability to, to, I suppose, override the official defaults by using a special variable, which is a dollar $PS default parameter values variable. And so we can tell our system, oh, if you call this command, and no value is given for this parameter, use this, this value for it. So you can set up default values specifically that work for you, which I think is a phenomenal way of actually making it as straightforward and as easy to make it for your environment. 
Equally, you can also go to what I call rapid commands, also called proxy commands. When you get a, a command out of the box, for example, uh, the one I alluded to before was convert to HTML. If that doesn't quite work for you, you can easily wrap your own code around the outside of that so that it is everything that the command was originally, but a little bit different. In my case, with the convert to HTML, the thing that I did that was different was to say, if you don't give anything for a head parameter, this is injecting code into the head tag on the HTML, I will put in a style sheet such that when it displays a table, it's actually an easier to read one. The default convert to HTML, you get a tabular display, but there are no borders around it. I find it particularly difficult to read. My version of it through the wrapper command was to use a style sheet so that I got the borders around it and used alternate background colors to sort of make it like line flow paper. If there's anybody in the audience who's old enough to remember what line flow paper looked like. So this gives you the chance to also to take the standard functionality and customize it so once again it's designed to specifically meet your needs and your environment. Because while there's no way that the guys at Microsoft could have any idea what your environment's going to look like, you know exactly what it's like. And so PowerShell gives you the ability to say, well, I will take the generic tools and I will set them up so they work exactly how I need them to work for our environment because we know all of the detail of it. That extendability, so looking at the, the modules as well, we can start to spread these out in terms of adding functionality. As I said earlier, the PowerShell 2, the big change that occurred with that was the script-based modules. So you can enhance functionality by writing your own scripts. You can then put them into special directory structures. And what that means is you can now access the commands that are in there in exactly the same way you access the commands that are in all of the other standard modules that come out, such as the Active Directory module. So for deployment, this is great because you don't need to know where that particular function was defined. You don't have to think, oh, that was such and such a script file. Okay, I need to find that script file now and run it. The module structure means that as you deploy it, you're saying the system knows exactly where to look. And one of the other changes that came in PowerShell 3 was you don't even need to import the module to use the functionality from it. They set the system up so that if you call a function, if it can't find it already loaded in memory, it will go and look through the modules which the system knows about to see if it's defined in one of those. So it makes the ability to deploy it very, very simple and very, very powerful. And fundamentally, scripts are just text files. Uh, you could use Notepad to write them if you want to. I seriously would not recommend, in fact, I'd recommend anything almost other than, than uh, using Notepad. But because they are simply a text file, it does make them easy to shift around. It does make them easy to copy from a file system to another. Although if you are doing it through the idea of modules, you do need to be aware of a particular structure that's there. But if you have a series of, of, I suppose, utility functions that you've written in PowerShell, you can just carry them around on a USB key with you. So if you need to go to a different environment, so long as you're going to an environment where they will accept a USB key being plugged in, you can take your own toolkit with you. So that gives you that flexibility, that ease of working. But this part is, I think, an critical bit of what SNOVA conceptualized. It is a, I say it's agnostic. The idea that he had was that we know what we have now, but we don't know what we're going to have in a few years' time. If you think back to the DOS box and the old cmd.exe and the days of DOS, uh, in the days of DOS, a computer was a very simple device. You had a basically a CPU, some memory, uh, a disk connected to a monitor and a keyboard. The only persistent part of your system was the disk. So the only real, I suppose, part of your system in those days of DOS was the file system. So when cmd.exe was written, effectively it was all about the file system. The concept was files and directories in a structure on a disk. Our systems now are so much more complex and so much more varied that it was important from Snova's point of view to conceptualize a system and, new, and develop one that would make sense across all of our different environments. Uh, for example, I can now go to the certificate store and just as easily as I can get a file listing off drive C, I can get a listing of all of the certificates out of the certificate store. I can go to SQL Server and interrogate SQL Server installations to find out about databases and the tables that exist within databases. 
I can look into the registry. Of course, that opens up uh, all sorts of interesting possibilities. Since for years, Microsoft told us you should never hack the registry. You're a bad person if you touch the registry. But by the way, we'll give you two tools for doing it. Well, PowerShell opens that up to give us some very, very simple command line access to all of the registry information as well. But we access these through what's through a thing called a PS provider. If someone develops a technology, so long as they then develop the provider, which is the code base which says, this is how you talk to one of these instances of these things, then you can actually create a drive to it. That gives us the ability to connect to what it, to some back-end data store, whatever it is, as if it were a disk drive in terms of, I suppose, the metaphor. So we'll get a drive identity, and I can then do things like DIR across whatever the drive name we gave it was, and it will interrogate it and start to show us the contents of that data store, wherever it is. The beauty of this approach is that as new technologies are developed, so long as the team developing the technology, at the same time, develop the providers and the ability to connect to them, PowerShell will just simply keep working in exactly the same way that it always has. And that, I think, is a huge bonus to us because that keeps it very open-ended, very flexible, and ensures, I suppose, the future of it. I say it makes all of those back-end store and data stores, be they the certificate store, SQL Server, the registry, PowerShell elements itself, the functions which PowerShell has loaded into memory, the variables which currently exist within our scripting context, all of these are accessible through these PS drives as well. And as we see newer technologies coming on, I would expect to see new providers being developed at the same time so that we can connect to those in exactly the same way. And it is a community. There are a lot of people globally who are keen and enthusiastic about PowerShell. And as such, they code in it because they enjoy it. Uh, I know some of the earlier coding I was doing when I first started working with PowerShell. A big part of learning any language environment is thinking, oh, I'm, the only way I'm going to learn it is by writing the code. You need to practice and you need to learn through your fingertips. So the big part was saying, well, I need something that I can write in PowerShell. And for a while, things that I should probably have developed as .NET applications, I thought, okay, I'll have a go at doing them in PowerShell just to see if I can. As I found the need to do other work, as I wanted to say, I need to sort of do something on my systems, I will develop PowerShell to support it. And thanks to the ability to very easily make modules, a lot of what I've developed I actually put into my modules to give me a support toolbox to enhance what I do. There are many people like this, like <laughs> doing work like this across the globe. And a lot of people who are doing it are actually making their work publicly available. Uh, there are a variety of postings over the years within the DDLS blog, which is that top listing. I've done some on my WordPress blog. I'm not probably as prolific as I should be. Uh, we've had other, there are other, a lot of other people doing it. But one place I would recommend in particular is going to PowerShell.org and signing up for their tip of the day, because you'll see a lot of resources being gathered there. But you can also subscribe to a mail list and just be sent a tip which says, here's something that somebody thought of that's different. And certainly in the early stages, I found that an intriguing way of seeing it because people were doing things with PowerShell that I just simply had never considered. And it makes you think about the reach that this particular technology has and the way that you can get out to doing other things with it. One of the, I suppose, the, the definite fallbacks is the scripting guy within Microsoft. Uh, all, the, all the MVPs and the PowerShell MVPs across the system also run blogs. So that's just a small collection of ones that I've gone to or some of the ones that I go to. There are many, many more out there. There is a huge, huge community out there working with PowerShell, and much of that community is happily sharing what they do, and so hoping to make other people's lives interesting. But just thinking, particularly, if I've struggled to work out how to do this, perhaps if I publish it somewhere, it might save someone else struggling in the, same, in the way that I did. So it tends to be very sharing as a community as well. But to get an idea of what it is, but to give you, I suppose, part of a sense of, of what would be turning up from this, according to Snova, and I say I keep coming back to according to Snova, you don't have to do the things the way he said that you should. You can write scripts any way that you choose to. My recommendation, though, is please don't, because a big part of what he was trying to do was have this consistent way that it works. And the beauty of this means that if someone has learnt PowerShell the way that Snowver intended it to be used, 
that means that if you go to another system, it's going to be familiar. If all of the work that you do works the same way, then anyone joining your team should be very comfortable at using your work. I believe fundamentally that if someone joins your, your IT team in particular, they shouldn't really know that they're using modules and command support that have been written in-house as part of an organizational support uh, compared to something which Microsoft deployed as part of the server installation. The only way they should possibly know it is an element of the naming. Uh, Snova says that all commands should be verb hyphen noun. And there is also a set of acceptable sort of predefined verbs, which are the standard verbs. And there's even a PowerShell command to find out what that is. If you ever type get verb, you'll get a list of all of the standard verbs. Good practice says is that the verb you should use should be one of those because those are going to be the verbs that staff are going to be most familiar with. And one of the ways that you find out about new commands, one of the crucial commands you get on is one called get command. And when you're looking for a particular bit of functionality, you'll take a guess around it. And now one of them could be to say, oh, the command, I want to do this sort of work, so I want to find all of the commands that use this verb. If you make your own verb up, and certainly there is nothing to stop you doing this, the catch with that is that when someone's trying to use get command and find the command that, that you have written, they may not look for that verb because it's not standard. And some of the analysis tools that you have that you can run over your script will tell you if you use a non-standard verb because it may make your, your code, your functionality, a little bit more difficult to find. It's designed to be a functional block. You should not have a Swiss Army knife solution in PowerShell. You want a small bit of work that does one thing and one thing well. And it should be able to work with a pipeline because this is where the power of the pipeline comes in. The idea is that objects come down the pipeline, as, as I said earlier, it's object oriented. An object comes into your command, your command does a little bit of work on it and then puts it out in the pipeline to the next part down the line. This is very much like a production line. And if you think about what a car production line must look like, uh, being here in Victoria, it's getting a lot more difficult now as we seem to have lost all of our car production lines. But if you were to go to the beginning of a production line, what you saw coming in at the beginning wouldn't look anything like a car at all. But as the, bit of the thing that came in moved down to the next workstation to have a little bit of work done on it and moved down to the next one for a little bit more, and the, the father of the production line, Henry Ford, had the idea that Everybody on the production line should do exactly the same thing every 30 seconds. Now that strikes me as being an horrendous, soul-destroying way of working. But the idea of it was that each workstation only did a little bit of work. Uh, in one book I remember reading many years ago, it described someone whose job on the car production line was simply to put three bolts in. And then the chassis moved down to the next workstation. The next bit came to his, he put three bolts in that again. And that's what he did day in, day out. Now, the reason I'm, I'm describing this in such detail is that if you have enough small bits of work being done, lo and behold, you eventually get to the end of the production line and you have a car. And PowerShell is designed to work the same way, is that a command or a commandlet should do one thing and one thing well, and then move it out to the pipeline. So if a bit more work needs to be done, it can do it the next, at the next station down. That also makes sure that the functionality that you've got is far more flexible because if you're doing one little bit of work very, very well, other people may decide to use that as a building block in their work in ways that you hadn't considered. And it's this object-oriented nature which is crucial to it. The sample code I have on there, get process, is a command which simply gets all the processes currently running on the computer that's identified. So by default, all processes on localhost. What that produces is a collection of objects where each object represents a process. You can then feed that to a thing called get member, which is the ability to look inside an object to find out what it is. And you can pipe that again to something like out grid view, which is a way of displaying it. The pipeline orientation probably more usefully is on the next uh, call out box down. With a get process, where object is a command, say where I want the name to be like power with a wildcard match. So I can get the processes and then very quickly focus on just the processes I want. Now under that earlier model, the get process should only do that. It should only get processes. 
If you wanted to do other work on that, such as filtering, you should use where object. If you wanted to sort them, then you use source object. The philosophy really says you shouldn't be doing get process with the ability to sort and the ability to filter and all the rest of it. Having said that though, Snover was very pragmatic in what he did. There are some commands that do support filtering, particularly the Active Directory commands. And I think this is pragmatism coming in. If you were to say get AD user, the default behavior on that is a model. We say, I will actually hit the Active Directory and I will get an object for every user in Active Directory. In large environments, that could be huge and could also really hammer Active Directory to the point where you actually had a very, very bad effect on the performance of your overall system. So the pragmatic approach on that command would say, you must put in a filter. If you want all the user objects, you can ask for them, but you have to explicitly ask for them. And I suspect that may well have been Microsoft lawyers saying, hey, we don't want people coming back saying that I was somebody was running PowerShell commands and a whole network sort of started to behave very, very poorly. You can get whatever it is you need. Pragmatism does come into a little bit of it. Frequently, your command is simply something you could have done by calling .NET if you were so inclined. Uh, in PowerShell 1, if you needed to send email messages, you had to delve down into the uh, .NET framework to get framework classes which enable you to, come, to be able to create an SMTP client to build an email message and to be able to send it out. PowerShell 2 gave us a command, send hyphen mail message, which is fundamentally a wrapper around that simply to make it easier. We can still do all of our usual command line stuff. You can still run ping, but there are also PowerShell commands which wrap the underlying functionality, such as if you use test connection. And that's one that I'm particularly fond of because one of the things with that is besides having the ability to set the count, which you can also do with ping, it has the ability to say, I will use a, a parameter, a, a switch called quiet. So instead of giving you the results of the ping, it will only give you a true or false. It'll let you know, did this work? In which case it makes it very, very useful when it comes to scripting. Because at that point, you can just simply put an if statement in, test connection, and so if that computer's online, then you'll simply go and access it. So you don't try to access computers which aren't available. Who should be looking at this? I believe, as I said earlier, anyone working with a computer should be interested in PowerShell. Specifically though, it is an administrative tool. So anyone looking after the system or any elements of the system should be using PowerShell. Uh, and also for developers, DevOps is becoming a big part of it. If anyone has a responsibility for looking at, for developing tools for the admin teams to use, PowerShell should be something that they are considering for this because this is sort of the generic tool for working our way through it. There have been over the years, MVPs in particular, saying that if you have administrator in your name and you don't know PowerShell, you won't have a job in two years' time. Now, the first time I read that was in 2011. That hasn't actually happened. I don't believe the guy was wrong. I believe it's more a case of he's not yet right. I think that if you are looking after systems, PowerShell is crucial to your knowledge. The sorts of areas where it can be used and why it's so good. Uh, this is a case study of a, a guy called Tim Bolton uh, was informed, just joined an organization, a financial services organization. They found that on one of their servers, one of the infrastructure elements wasn't running. It was actually a service for doing security, an RSA service. Uh, they had over a thousand servers. So he was given told, <laughs> you need to fix this. You need to find out what servers aren't running this service and fix it. And he thought, well, this sounds like something that PowerShell should be able to help me with. And yes, he, while he had basically no experience of PowerShell at the time, he contacted an MVP who helped them. They were able to interrogate all of the servers very quickly. Uh, you've got, uh, while he actually used a text file of server names to find out what servers they had, I, I believe a better way would have been to use get ad computer. So that way you could find out all of the computers in your Active Directory, reach out to each of them to find out if the service is running, and then find out just how big your problem is. As it turned out, I think in that case, he only had about 11 servers which were problematic, or 10 servers that were problematic. Then use PowerShell to deploy the code and to make sure the services were installed and up and running. Basically, dealt with about a thousand servers, having just been told we have this problem, could identify the scale of it, develop a solution, deploy the solution and have it fixed before lunch. And I think that that gives you some amazing sense of the flexibility and the power which you can reach out with. Getting it, it's been baked in now. If you, I suppose part of it becomes a little bit awkward 
in the sense of this now with the systems that we're running. Uh, the first baked in one was Windows Vista, the one that we most people sort of try to sort of pretend never existed. Server 2008, I suppose, was the first real sort of version of it where we got it installed. There were some upgrades to it. Windows 7 stage, we started to see it across the board. Uh, we started out with obviously version 1, and in fact, we still have that one embedded in the naming. It's a PS1 file. And if you look under your System32 Windows PowerShell directory, there's a folder of ver 1.0, which is where all the code is. We're now up to version 5. And essentially, any operating system that you work with, pretty much from Server 2, or from Vista, pretty much, or certainly Server 2008, had it baked in so that it was just simply there. A minor catch, if any of you happen to have Server 2003 out there still, uh, and I know that there are some people that do, that cannot go above PowerShell 2, which means that if you're developing scripts, you need to be very careful about testing them before you deploy them to make sure they will work within the Server 2003 environment, or hopefully upgrade your 2003. Fundamentally, I can do anything in PowerShell that I was doing with MMC, with my MMC snap-ins. I have PowerShell commands which will mimic the functionality of all of those management consoles. Part of what Snova's perception of where this is going is to say he wants to see a layer of management of automation in PowerShell, and that when you use things like MMC snap-ins, they actually sit on top of PowerShell. Uh, we first saw this, I think, in Exchange 2010. When you ran the GUI for running Exchange 2010, it actually wrote PowerShell. And in Exchange 2010's GUI, you could see the PowerShell that it wrote. Then it executed the PowerShell. So everything that that console was doing, it was actually doing in PowerShell. This is, the, I suppose, the plan, that all of the management will be done through this PowerShell layer. When you want a GUI-based tool, you'll put it on top of that. Now, for me, what that tends to imply is that all of the functionality will come into PowerShell first because it has to be there and be available before the GUI can make use of it. So if you can drop straight into PowerShell, you may well get a bit of a heads up on the functionalities that is there. And because it sits on top of .NET, anything that a .NET developer can do, so can you. Because you can call all of the .NET framework classes. You can code pretty much in the same way that a .NET developer does. So it is all wide open. But at that point, though, your code's going to get a lot more complex, and you would need to be comfortable with programming down at the framework level. Now, there are a couple of quirks. One of them is that to make life easier to move from the days of DOS and into PowerShell, and also from Unix into PowerShell, when it first gets installed, you get quite a lot of what are called aliases. These are a phrase that you can type, or, or a name that you can type, which is really just an alias for an underlying PowerShell command. So if you want to get a listing of files on your system, you can still type DIR. Now, there is no DIR command. It's an alias for get child item. Equally, if you're a Unix person, you could use ls for the same result. It's an alias for get child item. Now, this does create a little bit of a quirk because in cmd.exe, dir is actually a command built into the shell. So it is, has its own command switch structure. Whereas when you call get child item, you have to use the PowerShell version of it. So if you were used to using dir slash s, which would work in cmd.exe, that won't work in PowerShell because slash s isn't how PowerShell works. You'd have to use hyphen recurse. But you can run all of the command line utilities at Power, that uh, cmd.exe did, because command.exe itself only had about, I think, 20 or 30 commands. Most of what we did with, with DOS was based on .exe's.com external programs. We can run all of those in PowerShell as well, with also a minor quirk, is that some of the command lines don't run quite the same way, and that some of them were very complex. Some of them had special characters in them that PowerShell would interpret differently. And so there is a need to actually modify it when you use it within a PowerShell environment. And basically, it's as simple as a hyphen hyphen percent, which I had hoped to demonstrate for you, to show that you can now use other commands which wouldn't understand, where PowerShell would get confused by the command line and believe it meant something else. To say, no, don't try telling PowerShell with that hyphen, hyphen percent. Don't try and interpret this. Just hand whatever I've typed here through to the utility that I'm calling, because it's for the utility, not for you. So we can still do everything you could do in DOS, I say, but there are a couple of minor quirks, a couple of things that we need to look at just to avoid getting caught.
And in terms of reaching out to the system, certainly I can manage my own computer. There's a lot of things I do on my machine to make it easier. I've got commands uh, that I have written for managing services. I do quite a bit of work with SQL Server. So I've got some PowerShell commands to make it easy to run SQL Server services up and also to shut them down. So I don't want them running when I'm not doing the SQL Server work. I can reach out to other computers. In fact, I can easily reach out to all other computers on the network. I can manage the technologies because everyone developing these technologies is also providing PowerShell support for it as well. Manage the configurations of them. I was talking about desired state configuration before. One of the other things in PowerShell 5 that I didn't mention is I can use PowerShell 5 to install software. There's a package management structure that's built in there and uh, package repositories. So if you want Notepad++, for example, on a computer, you can tell PowerShell that you want to install it. It will reach out to a repository, download it, and install it for you. Now, admittedly, that's something Unix guys will be saying, well, we're going to do that for ages. I appreciate that. But PowerShell is still growing and giving us this functionality. There are also a lot of things that you can only do in Windows PowerShell. And this, I think, is the real wake up and smell the coffee moment. Because there are parts of the system that are only exposed via PowerShell. If you want to do a lot of the Azure support, you have to use PowerShell for this. So for me, I suppose this is the real wake up and smell the coffee moment. Because this is telling you that if you don't know PowerShell, there will be a lot of elements of your system that you simply can't manage. Because the only way to manage them is through PowerShell itself. And the three biggies for me, I suppose, about why you want to know this, you can automate. You should never do the same thing twice manually. If you start to do that, you say, hey, I should write a PowerShell script for doing this. If I need to do it again, I can do it easily. With good design, you can make this incredibly flexible with the way that it works. You can also, having made it scriptable, you can then schedule it. Many of the GUIs that we use for managing our systems, while we can manage the system, we can't schedule it to run later. If I want to do it again, I've got to open up the GUI and tick all the boxes and fill in all the fields all over again and then hit the go do it button. Whereas by writing as a PowerShell script, I can just simply run the script or schedule it. And I can provide focus. If you look at some of these GUIs, the tools are large. And you only want to use a small part of it. Uh, a scenario I quite often refer to in, in my classes is imagine for, say, entry-level help desk staff. They only use small parts of the system but the problem being is the tool which gives them that little bit of the system is very, very large. You don't want to give them the huge tool. For example, you may not want to give them Active Directory users and computers. You can write a very simple little tool in PowerShell, and you can also put GUIs on top of your PowerShell as well. That's very, very straightforward. So that you might say, have the example, uh, you run up this utility, it gets a list of all of the locked out accounts. They can simply choose an account, click on an unlock button, and you unlock an account which is giving you great focus into the Active Directory user and computers tool. And that repeatability. Because if you need to do it more than once, it's far better to let the system do it rather than you having to do it yourself all of the time. And at this point, guys, I had hoped to be able to actually show you much of this working, particularly the Active Directory, putting the GUI in to demonstrate some class code. Unfortunately, having no idea why the sharing of my machine is not working, I can't. I will endeavor to get some of these available to the DDLA staff so they can mount them up on the website. Uh, but I apologize for the lack of demonstrations because that was something which I considered important because you needed to see what was happening. But in terms of saying is how do you get on from here, DDLS offer two PowerShell courses. The 6.1 course is the introduction to PowerShell, learning how it basically works, getting it started off, then in advanced automation, getting into some of the higher end features of it. Experimentation is crucial. The only way you learn this, in my opinion, is through your fingertips. Uh, there are some standard commands which you will use a lot you need to get very familiar with. But just try to do it and have fun with it. Just play with it. Because the worst, probably in many ways, the worst way to learn it is the way that Tim Bolton had to. You have a problem. You have to get this fixed. There is a ticking clock. So you have to learn all about PowerShell at the same time. Far better to learn at your own pace, doing things that you enjoy. And then once you've got your head around it, It'll make it better when the pressure comes on. As a chance to have a go, I suppose, at getting on from that is unfortunately, there's a slide missing which came up from there. DDLS is about to launch a PowerShell um, competition, a scripting competition, which will be turning up very shortly. Uh, and the idea of this is what we want to see submitted from you guys is PowerShell scripts that you have written just to do something that was fun, something that was small. It doesn't have to be. Uh, a huge, sophisticated thing. 
The idea is we just want to have a quick look. Ah, there it is, back by popular demand. Excellent. Starting on June the 1st, running through the 31st of October. More information can be held on their website as a quick overview of it. The scripts, no more than 50 lines of functional code. Uh, there's also a utility, or should be available, we'll make sure it's available on that site, which is the code that I'll use for counting the number of, file, of lines of script in your code as well. Uh, restricting to 50 mainly because we don't want huge solutions and also I need to be able to evaluate them and also the team that hopefully will be helping me to evaluate them. And it's an idea with this is it doesn't have to be, I suppose, sensible. Just something which is new, something which you enjoy doing, something which is fun, hopefully, but something which is just does actually work and do something particularly if you found it useful. Uh, there are prizes for this, for the first one, sort of the, the three great prizes on there, so you'll find more of that on their website, and more information about the structure that's behind it. Uh, so hopefully you will have a bit of fun playing with that, and you've got two months starting on Thursday to get your idea up and running, to hopefully test it against the same tools we use for testing it when the evaluation is carried out and a chance to have a, a bit of a play and get some ideas for it. And if I go back to here. An interesting com a couple of comments, though, admittedly while they were uh, from a while ago, I still believe they're incredibly valid, is the idea is that automation is how you work smarter. And we keep hearing you need to be able to work harder, not smarter. I believe fundamentally that PowerShell is how you do that when you're looking after systems. And I like Don Jones's comment that when you learn it, you're doing this for yourself in your career. I suppose being hard-nosed about this, if uh, organizations are looking at rationalizing their staff level, whatever the current business version of that is at the moment, uh, if you can automate, that means you can work more effectively, that makes you more employable, both within your organization, or if you want to move around, it enhances what you can do. Now on top of that, I'd also say it's fun, but that's probably just my perspective because I enjoy it. But on the basis that I've been known to wake up in the early, sort of about two o'clock in the morning with PowerShell scripts running through my head, that's probably taken a little bit too far. But I believe that PowerShell is a crucial toolbox, sort of toolbox and unit within your development and within your management of the systems. Hope that there's been some interesting and useful bits in there in terms of getting a context of what PowerShell is about. The only way you will actually really appreciate what you can do with it is to actually use it and learn through your uh, through your fingertips, which does mean we urge a certain amount of caution about working on production systems. Hopefully in your environments, you've got test environments or practice environments you can play with because the potential for things going wrong is also quite large, obviously, because of the depth within to our system we can reach with this and the speed with it can make changes. But having had my voice continuously through that, which unfortunately was not how I intended to do it, uh, well, I'd like to now head over and see if there are questions that people would like answers to and uh, hopefully I will do my best to answer unfortunately in text or sort of in talk rather than actually in demonstration. So okay, Manuela. Thanks French. Yes, we've already got some questions. Um, is there a PowerShell script for, um, is there a PowerShell script to recreate Windows 7 or later version user profiles? That's from Locke. Not one that I've seen, uh, but basically in many cases what it means is I haven't seen it yet because I haven't actually gone looking for something like that. If you can do it through running management console tools will be way into it. Not something that I have actually come across. Now, these are pro part of us both is where the profiles were stored. Uh, but no, I wouldn't, uh, if you could email, actually, that, that's an interesting one. If you could email that in to a contact point. Um, I'm sure that uh, hopefully Manuela can give you an email contact. We can send that in, or I'll keep that. And if I can get an answer to that, I'll get it up on the DDLS blog. I'll look into that. Okay, and we've got another question from Steve. Is there a new version of PowerShell in the wings? I would imagine almost five has only just come out, uh, which came out initially with Windows 10 and Server 2016 and you can download it to install it and sort of onto earlier systems of it. They've also changed PowerShell ISE's deployment model now. There's actually a preview for the next version of PowerShell ISE. And the interesting thing is that the deployment for it now is through install module in PowerShell rather than downloading and running up an executable for it. 
So they're definitely making it easier to deploy that out. Uh, I haven't seen anything for the next version of it. I'm hoping that they enhance classes because they'd still need a bit more work on it. Uh, depends on, I suppose, how they choose to upgrade the server infrastructure to find out how they do it. The commands will upgrade every time they bring out a new system. The language, because there are these two elements, will probably want to come up a little bit later on. Hopefully that answer, the answer is I don't know at the moment, but I would expect that it will continue as development. But the development may well be more slipstreamed in rather than a brand new install. It's a bit like the claim that Windows 10 is the last desktop operating system they're ever going to do, because what will happen is it will just keep upgrading itself. And seeing PowerShell ISE being able to be upgraded through that model, I think that's the way we'll see it. Okay, perfect. I've got another question from Audrey. Yep. I want to know if it is possible to have a user-friendly GUI from that allows internal end-user, yeah. business user, non-IT to call PowerShell scripts without the need to know what the script does. Absolutely. Uh, it's very straight. Well, there's two ways of doing it. One is you can write the code to do it yourself. It's not one that I would recommend because it's, while it's not hard, it is incredibly painful. Uh, I happen to use a commercial product called PowerShell Studio for doing GUI design. And the idea with PowerShell Studio is it looks very much like Visual Studio for the developers out there, but it means that I can build a GUI by dragging and dropping. And having dragged and dropped things like text boxes and buttons, I can then simply write the PowerShell behind it. If I want to have it so when, he, when the person running this GUI clicks on a button, I can just double click on it in my designer and it will write all the code for me to make it work, the skeleton. Then I just write in a bit of code to do the functionality for clicking the button. And the beauty of that is that they don't need to know, and more importantly, uh, well actually that tool also allows me to actually convert it to a .exe file to wrap it and package it. So what I give the person to use is a .exe. They don't even, may not even know that it's PowerShell. Uh, an example, and it's on the DDLS blog or on one of my blogs, um, I think I had a reference earlier on, is a GUI that I wrote which looks into Active Directory to extract a lot of information such as locked out accounts, uh, accounts with passwords expiring, accounts where the password never expires because auditors get really upset about that, and a GUI front end to it. Now, in that particular utility, if you looked at the PowerShell script, it's about a thousand lines of code. But in terms of what I wrote, there's only about 200 lines of code because the PowerShell Studio wrote all of the code that was needed to make the GUI itself work. Now, I only sporadically go looking for other tools that might allow someone to develop GUIs. And it's been a while since I've done that, which is why I, I mean, PowerShell Studio works for me, so I keep using it. But yes, it is very, very easy to develop a GUI, but you really, I would recommend that if you're going to do it though, that you look at purchasing or finding a tool which enables you to build the GUI with drag and drop and then just put the code in that you need it. So PowerShell Studio from Sapien is the one that I use. Okay, and then the next question is from Ivan. How do you suggest managing script re um, repository across an infrastructure team? Uh, one of the, the ways that the modules work out of the box is that PowerShell will look in a and a special environment variable called PS module path. And it's a bit like the old path one that we used to, that we should be familiar with. Uh, whereas the, the old DOS would sort of go looking in all of the directories and the path listed in the path variable to see if it could find the command you you've typed in. What PowerShell will do is look in all of the directories you list in the in the PS module path to see if it can find a module. Now in that path variable you can put in a UNC path. So one thing, I, one of the areas I would look at is saying I would have a file server with the organization module on there. And then for everyone who needs to work with that module, then the UNC path to that file share goes in their PS module path in their environment. Okay, commands coming off there obviously will load a little bit more slowly because they've got to come across the network. But I see the advantage of that though, meaning is that when you do maintenance on it, you don't have to remember who has actually got this installed on their machine because I need to redeploy it out to every single machine. It gives you an organizational repository for it. And I think that the ability to use UNC paths is a great way of making that work. Okay. And we have a question from Stephen. Hi Brent, how can we use PowerShell to simplify our patching, for example, cumulative updates of one of 100 yeah. odd SQL instances. 
there is yeah, uh, there is a, a, a module to help work with that and some commands certainly around both two parts. One is, is basically check what's available there and to manage it. It's not one that I've used, so I don't actually look after uh, a network which we're doing the cumulative patches with. Uh, once I don't know the specific ones for it. I know that there are some out there for doing that, and there are some commands within the tools within the server management tools. And just as we manage it through um, the deployment tools that we have out of Microsoft, I think I've seen some which are the PowerShell commands. Once again, uh, if you can track that for me, Manuel, I'll see if I can come up with a better answer for that and get it put up on the DDLS blog. Okay. And then we have a question from Michael. How does PowerShell do physical stuff? They have their own module for it. Uh, so the idea of PowerShell is the command line interface that works. Uh, a tech ed I went to a few years ago, they had a, Cisco guys had a, a stand there and I was curious about exactly what Cisco was doing with PowerShell. And what I found was their data center people. And when I asked them about it, they were not certain, but said there were two PowerShell modules for supporting their data center. Uh, one of the things you can do quite neatly, and they fortunately let me do on their system, is you can type git command hyphen module name, which will list all of the commands from a specific module. Knowing the two module names that were used, then I simply said, okay, I'll send that to a measure object, which gives you a count. And what I found was that on those two modules, there were about 8,000 commands that Cisco deployed for supporting their data center environments. So I simply, just, this is the tricky part of the head on that slide earlier I, with the changes and giving an idea of the growth. I don't believe that as PowerShell has been developing, the learning curve has gotten much steeper. It's certainly getting a bit steeper, but not significantly steeper. But it is certainly getting a hell of a lot higher because as more and more people get on board, there's more and more commands. So a huge part of what you need to get into early on in PowerShell is learning how you learn what's on offer. And things like get command and identify the module to find all of the commands that come from it, that's an important way of seeing just what's there. Let's say for Cisco, <laughs> over 8,000 commands for supporting their data center. So yeah, there's a, a learning, there's a lot of learning to be done, but that's how they've put it in there. Okay, and then we have a question from Chavi. Hi, Brent, is there any Microsoft cert for PowerShell? Not that I've ever seen. What they're doing in their exams now is they're including PowerShell because they're really saying is this is a way of managing a technology. So what you're starting to find in the exams is PowerShell questions rather than specifically uh, giving you an exam on PowerShell. Uh, even though if you attend one of the courses, you'll still find a slide that makes reference to exams. I've never seen a PowerShell exam, so they're just absorbing it into all of the others. Okay, perfect. And then we have a question from Ivan. PowerShell is being used for a lot of recent malicious attacks. Apart from signing scripts, do you have uh, any suggestions for protecting against unauthorized use? The big one on that is the signing. They, Microsoft learned a lot from the issues they had, particularly the VBS scripting. The, do, the signing of scripts tied in with code access security, that was the part where we, that probably doesn't get as much discussion, is that part of what .NET gave us way back in 2002, when they first brought it out, was the ability to sign code and the ability to configure code access policies around that. Now, admittedly, one of the reasons for not getting much use may have been it produced the second ugliest command line tool that I've ever seen in the world. But as that grew, you could now start to set security models up saying that these resources can only be accessed by things signed with these particular signatures. Uh, a big part of it is signing, a big part of it, an element of it is the execution policy. So you can say I, that scripts must be signed or if they're not loaded from a local machine but they came over the network, they must be signed so you have remote signing. The catch is there's always ways around this. Uh, you can bypass that. But the idea behind their security model was to say, if somebody knows what they want to do, we need to be able to let them do it. What we want to prevent is people not knowing what they're doing inadvertently or accidentally running scripts. So it's, a, I suppose, more of a, of a stumbling block than an actual locked door. But I'd say, yes, you've been seriously looking at, co at signing your, your certificates, uh, signing your scripts, and also using code access security on top of that. The signing of the script just says, hey, I'm just going to have it, it must have a valid digital certificate. Well, it's very easy to, to produce your own certificate and sign any script that you want to. The this test initially is just saying, is this signature valid, in which case I will run it. 
So you then want to look at going that next level and actually making use of that certificate for part of your security model. Perfect. And then the question from Audrey, is PowerShell Studio license based? Uh, the one that I've got, you can get it as individual. I think they support team, like I'm not sure whether they've got team licenses on it. It's also an element of subscription based now as well. They change their license a little bit, but you get an annual subscription. Uh, the idea of that is while you have a valid subscription, you will continue to get automatic, you can automatically update. Now you don't lose it. My understanding is that if you don't renew your subscription, you don't lose PowerShell or any of, the, any of the Sapien tools, you just lose any updates to them. Uh, I think they have uh, sort of team license type structures as well. But certainly the sort of version that I've looked at, you get an individual license. Okay, and then the question from Doug, you showed a slide earlier with PowerShell, PowerShell versions. Yes. Are commands essentially backwards compatible across versions or is it like .NET where you need a different framework between versions? Uh, it's relatively, but it's more the, the structure of the language changes, but there have been a few changes when we're particularly from PowerShell 2 to PowerShell 3 and no, no one seems to talk about PowerShell 1 anymore. From PowerShell 3 onwards, it's worked pretty well. But what's happening is that the PowerShell code will run on the machine that it's on. So that obviously, so it's, it's got to be compatible with the environment that it's running on. Now you can use connectivity from a late end machine with a high, sort of much later version of PowerShell to reach out and talk to an earlier version machine. But if you want your script to run on it, then if it's using elements specific to that PowerShell release, uh, a classic example is in PowerShell 2, the dollar underscore was used to represent the concept of the thing I'm currently looking at. PowerShell 3 supports that, but also supports dollar PS item to mean the same thing. Now the problem is if you tried running the, a script with dollar PS item on, it, on a PowerShell 2 machine, it wouldn't run. So that becomes highly problematic. So the backward, going backwards will be, there's an element of issue, an element of risk. And so testing should always be put in place. It isn't anywhere near as bad as it used to be in the sense that most of this is a layered approach to how they develop it. And it depends obviously when you call the commands. If you're running a script, writing a script on say a PowerShell 5 machine, but the script is being deployed to a machine that's only got PowerShell 3 on it, then it has to also be compatible with whatever commands are on there as well. So, so at that point, testing becomes, is always going to be an important part for it. Okay, great. Um, we've got another question. Does the DDLS course cover DSC and can you monitor configuration drifts with DSC? Yes, and the advanced module, the 10962, has a lesson on using desired state configuration. And one of the commands as part of the desired state configuration work is test configuration. So it uses the local configuration manager to actually run the MOF file. That basically, DSC creates MOF files, the managed object format files, which then get deployed out. And they can be deployed either with a pull model or a push model. You can push them out. Or you can also set your system up so it regularly pulls out any updated MOFs and then applies them. So you can automate that whole deployment part of it. But if you want to see what's going on, there is a test config DSC configuration command, which will tell you whether or not it complies with what was specified or whether it's drifted. So yeah, there's an infrastructure for supporting that. Having said all that, if you have System Center, you're probably doing all of this with System Center. But the nice thing is, is this is free. And if you don't have System Center, you can get a lot of the similar functionality. And I think in parts of it, even if you do have System Center, this gives you a very nice tight focus to sort of look into just those bits that you want. Okay, and then we've got another one. Um, does PowerShell do infrastructure as a code? So I'm not quite sure what that question is actually asking me. Okay, so maybe... Yeah. If you can send us another um, note to just clarify what you're after. Um, we'll just move on to the next question for now. Um, I've got one from Richard. You mentioned PS2 is the highest version to use on Server 2003. Yep. Can I use PS5 on a user laptop running Windows 7 if the back end of our infrastructure is still running Server 2003? Yeah, you can still run the PowerShell script code on your, on your, on your laptop 
and it can still reach out to your Server 2003 machine, but you can only do what's compatible with Server 2003 when you reach out to it. So on all of those commands to support computer names as a parameter, you can use that for reaching out to your 2003 server. But the problem is that if you want to actually deploy the script itself to your 2003 server, it has to be compliant with PowerShell 2 or it's going to simply fail. Now, it is there's a relatively straightforward way of testing the first instance. If you run PowerShell.exe itself, there is a switch on that hyphen version. So if you go PowerShell.exe, hyphen version 2.0, and then use that to, to run the script file. Even on a later version of PowerShell, you can test, because what that will do is run up a PowerShell 2 compliant version of the host for testing. So if you do want to see if you can run the script on your 2003 server, you can. That way, rather than deploying it out there and finding out that it doesn't work. But all of your scripts, if they're being executed on later versions, they can do whatever is applicable to that version and they can reach out to your 2003 service using things to say, uh, using WMI to reach out and interrogate the systems, for example. <laughs>